not in the Bible. So we're continuing this series where we're trying to learn what the Bible says by asking the question, what the Bible does not say. And I've gotten a lot of feedback as we've been going through this series. In fact, last week, someone at the door on their way out said to me, I sure wish that you would preach longer. <laughs> I got to thinking, that's not something pastors hear very often. In fact, I started thinking, I wonder what other phrases pastors wish that they could actually hear in church. So I thought about some. I wrote a few down. How about this? Could we pass the offering plate a second time? <laughs> maybe, maybe this, just, just one time. Hey, it's our turn to sit in the front row. Or I love this one. I love it when we sing songs we, I've never heard before. I thought this would be good. We need a big change in our church before people get too comfortable. And my favorite that I came up with, I'm starting a petition to double your salary. <laughs> now, there are certain phrases I think that most pastors would love to hear just one time at church, but, but there are also some phrases that we wouldn't mind if we never heard again. And most of them are said with very good intentions as people try to, to give comfort to someone who's in a season of pain or, or suffering. So someone might say, God must think a lot of you to, to put you through something like this. Or God will never give you more than you can handle. And notice that all of these kinds of expressions place the culpability for people's struggles and trials solely on God. God has to own up to, to His responsibility for why it is that I am in such a tough place. And that is often what is behind the phrase that you might hear when someone says, everything happens for a reason. And the subtle assumption is that God has a reason that He is putting you through so much difficulty. And that shows up all the time. Last football season, during a meaningless preseason football game, Jordy Nelson, all-pro receiver for the Green Bay Packers, fell down, hurt his knee. We found out he actually tore his ACL, and he was out for the entire season which that was a tremendous blow to the Green Bay Packers. But Glover Quinn, a safety for the Detroit Lions, had an interesting interpretation of this. And, and he said of the event, he told the Detroit Free Press, I hate Jordy got hurt, but, but in my belief, it was God that meant for Jordy to get hurt. So if he wouldn't have got hurt today or played in that game, then the next time he walked on the field would have been opening day and God would have had him get hurt then. So it really was better because it gave the Packers time to make adjustments in their roster. In, in other words, God had ordained that Jordy Nelson was going to tear up his knee. So in God's kindness... He had it happen three weeks before the season started so the Packers could have more time to react. Now, what is obviously wrong with that theology is, for one, God loves the Green Bay Packers and would never hurt any of them. <laughs> but seriously, I do not believe that God is in heaven orchestrating which football player does and does not have to get hurt in which game. Now, I do believe that things happen for a reason in the sense that God has wired the principle of causality into creation. That's why we have the sciences, because where there is an effect, you can deduce a cause. But you better exercise caution when you start attributing cause to explain every effect and wind up giving credit to God. You see, here is the problem. Write this down. Everything does happen for a reason, but the reason isn't always God. Now, I think it is wrong 
not to give God the honor that he is due. But I also think it is wrong to give God credit he is not due and to hold God responsible for something that he did not do. So everything happens for a reason, but the reason isn't always God. For example, I could be the reason. Because the Bible says a man is going to reap what he sows. So if you're driving and you're texting and all of a sudden you find yourself in an automobile accident, that's not God. If you're partying too much and you're in college and you flunk out of school, you cannot say, well, God just has a better plan, I guess. If you eat poorly, you drink too much, you never exercise, sit on your couch and watch every show on Netflix there is, and then you have a stroke in your 40s, you really can't point your finger at heaven. Point your finger at the person that you look at in the mirror every morning. See, the reason I'm so adamant about this is because I cannot tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who are suffering the consequences of self-inflicted wounds and they're angry at the church or they're angry at God. The Bible even references this in the book of Proverbs. It says that people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then they're angry at the Lord. So this is why you need to be careful about how you invest yourself Emotionally, spiritually, relationally, financially, because you will reap what you sow. And if you're going through a really tough time right now, you could be the reason. Or others could be the reason. We can be profoundly blessed or profoundly wounded by the actions of other people. As a minister, I have been around many hurting and broken families and broken people. I have been blessed with a wife of almost 25 years. We have not been problem free, but we have been able to experience those problems together freely. And the longer I'm married, the more I realize how much of a blessing it is to have someone like Shannon in my life. I try to tell her all the time, you realize how lucky you are to be married to me. <laughs> the reality is, uh, other people have a, a huge impact on our lives, and that could be for good, that can be for ill. Somebody broke a promise. Someone lied. Someone broke their marriage vow. These things matter. It is one reason why the Bible is so emphatic about loving your neighbor and even loving your enemy. Because you don't want to be the reason something bad came into their life. You want to be the reason that something good came. Because other people have a tremendous influence on our lives. And, then, and we just have to talk about this, and I know this is a little strange for some people, but the Bible says sometimes Satan could be the reason. Now, I know some people take this too far, but the reality is Jesus believed in a real devil who does real things in the real world. For example, in one of his parables about the kingdom, he said this in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and asked, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Why or where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. In other words... Jesus believed that just as God is active and intervening into the affairs of this world, the devil is also active. Sometimes we know that. The Apostle Paul, we've we referenced this, said about that thorn in his side, I asked God to take it away, but 
but I know it was an assault of Satan. Now, sometimes we don't know that. So you go to the book of Job, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, but that righteous man went through extreme suffering, and he never knew the devil was the reason. And so you need to hear me say this. Spiritual warfare is not the occasional possibility. It is the daily reality for every believer in Jesus. Because the devil is real. And he does real things in the real world. But I think most of the time when we go through a very difficult season, fallenness could be the reason. We are all caught in the backwash of Adam's sin. And God did not just curse Adam for his sin. The, the whole creation was cursed. And we are all unalterably connected to a creation that is in bondage to decay. The world that is now is not the world that was. And the frustration with the world that is is universal. And I mean that universally. Paul helps us understand this in Romans chapter 8. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now that's why you have tornadoes and tsunamis and cancer. The creation is broken. And we are misguided in expecting it to be any other way. It is wrong to be angry and think, life just isn't fair. Life was never promised to be fair because this creation is in decay. And the world that is, is not the world that God made. Now, I cannot let God totally off the hook. Because even though he may not be the primary reason that you are going through what you are dealing with right now, it is true that he is on his throne and he chose not to intervene and stop it. So God did not cause the cancer. But God chose not to heal it either. God did not ordain that there would be a car wreck. But someone's life was taken. So one of the things that we wrestle with is the intention and the activity or the non-activity of God in a world that is filled with so much evil. But we have got to be very careful here. This is where the book of Job really does help us. Many people think the book of Job is about the problem of suffering. I do not. I think it is about the problem of faith in a world that's full of suffering. Job does not answer the question, why do people suffer? Job asks the question, will people trust God even when they don't know why they suffer? And the book of Job warns us against an entitlement spirit that thinks that God owes us an explanation when bad things happen. And you get to the end of that book and it's very clear, God does not have to exercise his sovereignty in a way that makes sense to you. We are the ones in need of justification, not God. By the way, for what it's worth, my over 25 years of being a pastor has taught me that reason is overrated. Enlightenment is not going to bring you all of the relief you think it will. The child in college finds out his parents are divorcing. Do you think that that will hurt him any less if he knows why? The mother that loses a child. Do you think that if she knows why she lost her child, it will hurt less than if she never knows the reason? Reason is so overrated, and at some level, it can even become idolatrous. Because anytime you say, I need this as much as or more than God, you're getting into the realm of idolatry. The Bible is asking, will you trust God when there doesn't seem to be a reason? And that 
kind of trust does not come from connecting the dots. It, it comes from connecting our pain to God's heart. We connect what we don't know, what we can't know, what we might never know, to what we absolutely do know about God. Again, the Apostle Paul helps us very much in this. He says, we, we know, not we speculate, we guess, we hope, we surmise. He says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for the good of those who love him. So when you're dealing with a, a season of suffering and you don't know why, my suggestion to you is this. Instead of searching for a reason, focus on where God is at work. Paul says God works in all things, not just in good things. Things And that does not mean that God causes all things. It means that no thing can cause God to stop working for your good. Because understand, things just don't work out for good on their own. Because this world is broken, and if any thing works out for good, you can know that God was at work. Think about the very first picture of God in the Bible. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the very first part of the verse, the earth was formless and empty. Formless and empty. Those, those Hebrew words are tohu and bohu. I love those words. But then God speaks, and good begins to show up. Somebody needs to come up with a bumper sticker that says, Tohu and Bohu happens. Because it still does. And God still speaks. And God still works. And order and design and beauty and good come from what was chaos. He doesn't cause chaos. He, he brings good out of chaos. He, he brought our salvation out of the most evil act in history. And sometimes we can see God at work and it, and it helps us to cope. I've shared this before, but I remember a time when my wife and I were going through something incredibly horrible. We had gone off to New England to work with a church uh, a brand new church for the summer. I was in Bible college and so was she. And my wife, we were newly married for just, you know, a little over a year, about a year and a half. And Shannon had become pregnant. It was a miracle. But while we were there, we'd only been at this new church for just a couple weeks. We were living in an apartment complex in Manchester, New Hampshire, and the only directions that I knew was basically from the apartments to the church and to the grocery store and a couple of other places. I hadn't really figured out the area, the town, very well at all. And one night, my wife woke up in the middle of the night cramping and in, in incredible pain, screaming, and there was blood and I had to get her into the vehicle and rush her to the hospital, but I had no idea where the hospital was. And I literally sat in the car at the exit to, from the apartment complex to turn right or left, and I cried out with tears on my face and my wife was in utter pain. God, I don't know which way to turn. You've got to help me. And I turned right. And I'm not kidding you, it wasn't even a block before I saw a blue sign with a white H and an arrow. And, and you've been in that kind of a scenario where you, you saw God working and it helped you. But there are those times when you cannot see God and you you just have to struggle to believe that he is still at work. The Sistine Chapel took 
Michelangelo over five years to paint. And in the process, very early on, he received criticism from people that would come in and, and they would say, we, we don't understand, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and he would say, in the first place, I'm not obligated to tell you my vision. Secondly, even if I explain my vision to you, you probably won't understand it, but you need to support me and you need to help me. And when this is done, you will understand, I promise. 500 years later, we get it. Trusting God does not mean it is wrong to groan. It means it's wrong to gripe. Decay stinks. And God gives us permission to acknowledge the stinkiness of life. Faith does not mean pretending that bad things are really good things. Faith means trusting that a good God will work for our good today because he's going to make all things right someday. Because God has not promised immunity. God has promised eternity. So again, the Apostle Paul says in verse 18 of Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Christians are not different because we don't have trials. We're not different because our problems are smaller. We're different because our hope is bigger. And hope gives us a strength and an endurance that reasons never could. Because you see, we, we do have a reason. Write this down. There is a reason why hope can trump the mystery and the pain. There is a reason why we believe evil will not have the last word. There's a reason why we can trust God even when we don't understand. There's a reason why we don't grieve like the rest of the world who has no hope. What is the reason? Well, here is the reason. Jesus Christ conquered death. God in Christ came to us. God in Christ became like us. God in Christ has experienced evil with us. He went to a cross and he died for us. He took our sins away from us. And then he left the grave to show us that when God works, God wins. And one empty tomb trumps a whole head full of reasons. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And as long as that tomb is empty, I've got a reason to keep on going. Dr. Diane Comp is a pediatric oncologist. Just think about those two words I just said for a moment. She spends her days helping small children fight cancer. And she confessed she was not a person of faith, but she wrote a book entitled Window to Heaven. And she describes her journey to becoming a believer. And what, what prompted it was watching how people go through the worst hell imaginable. Cope. She said, a turning point for me was when I walked into a room and there's a little boy about three years old battling leukemia. His mother is beside his bed. And beside the bed, there's a table, and on the table, there is a book. And the book's title is, Is the Resurrection of Jesus Christ Relevant Today? And Dr. Comp asked that mother, what do you think? And she looked at her little boy who was laboring to breathe. And she turned to Dr. Comp, and with an inexplicable peace and strength, she said, I know it's relevant so when you cannot see what God is doing, you hold on to what you know God has already done and to what he has promised he will do. So the next time that God gives you the privilege to walk beside somebody that is in great pain, 
please don't feel like you have to say anything. Maybe just your presence is enough. But if you do speak, don't feel like you need to analyze all of the reasons. And please do not minimize their hurt. But point to the work of God in Christ Jesus and emphasize the hope. Now some people think they might be right. That when we get to heaven, we're finally going to get all of the wise answered. And everything's going to make sense, maybe. Here's what I think. That when we get our first glimpse of the beautiful, powerful, kind face of Jesus, why won't matter anymore? John Ortberg, in his book, Soul Keeping, describes what Dallas Willard had taught him about being a, a disciple. Dallas Willard was, was one of the greatest Christians in our generation. He influenced countless people, authored many books. A few years ago, he passed away, and his friend Gary was right there by his side when, when Dallas was passing away. He was in great suffering, but, but he said in his last moments, Dallas began to have a conversation, but it wasn't with Gary. And Gary told John Ortberg, I don't know what he was seeing, but his last words were, thank you, thank you. And then he died. And when you finally see Jesus, you are going to have a good reason to say the exact same thing.